This is the Horse Radio Network. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. Good Thursday morning, everybody. I am Glenn the Geek in Ocala, Florida. Actually, I'm on my way to Denver, Colorado right now. Along with Jennifer, we are on our way to the WISA conference, which is a trade show out in Denver. It's the place where we find our potential sponsors, meet a lot of people, meet a lot of friends. And we're going to be out there to also taking a look for new products. We're going to record interviews about new products coming to the market and bring them to you here over the next couple of weeks. In the meantime, because Jennifer's on an airplane, we couldn't do Mary Kitzmiller episode today. So we're bringing you a past Mary Kitzmiller episode. This is one from May of 2018, where she answers listener questions about introducing a horse to the garage pole, also getting a horse to stop on its hind quarters, how and why to introduce a target using positive reinforcement. And Jerry Jones joins them to talk about training a steer. That's right saddle training a steer to ride so this was a fun episode we thought you would enjoy probably hearing it again so we're going to play that for you here right now and then tomorrow morning we have debbie laux taking my place and joining jamie and jemmy and they'll be providing a brand new episode for you it will not be live as well Uh, we'll be back live on monday morning with i'm sure all kinds of stories of the things we found over at wisa in denver So we'll talk to you on Monday, and we hope you enjoy today's Best Of and tomorrow's brand new episode. Well, good Thursday morning. This is Coach Jen in Ocala, Florida. And I'm Mary Kitts Miller from Kemp, Texas, and you're listening to Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network for May 10th, episode 1931. Today's show is brought to you by Horsewear. Good morning, Horse World. What is your favorite day of the week? never stop learning, you never stop understanding. It's more in depth than just riding a horse. Exciting, knowing that for the rest of my life I could work on this and, and I'll never stop learning. Welcome back, Mary. Second Thursday of the month and here she is. How are you doing, Mary? Oh my gosh. Um, I'm okay. Uh, Once again, my computer failed me when I needed it the most, and I have no sound. So instead of using the lovely Skype, uh, I'm on my landline because um, my uh, my property, it's like being in the 80s out here. I I uh, (laughs) haven't caught up to... 2000, you know, technology. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. Your your internet service is like that bad boyfriend that you really should break up with. Yeah, but there's like no better option. <laughs> it's better than being alone, I guess. And uh, yeah, Is it? Yeah. Is it really? <laughs> uh no. No, it's it's an abusive lifetime movie boyfriend yeah. that, you know, the wise mother warned me about in the beginning of the movie, but I didn't listen. So, yeah, that's how it is. That's how it is. <laughs> well, we're glad you came back just the same. We've got a a uh, a busy show coming up. We've got a training tip about punishment. Ah! Scary scary word. And then we're going to talk with a volunteer listener, Carly, who's going to ask her question on the air. Yay! And then after our little break for a Templeton Thompson song cuz that's what I always play, we're going to chat with Jerry Jones, and it says here in my production notes Cow training. So that's going to be interesting to find out whether we're training Jerry, the cow, or the horse. And then we're going to wrap things up with some more listener-submitted questions from the auditor's Facebook page. And if you're not an auditor, you need to go to horseradionetwork.com and click on the Become an Auditor. And uh, check it out. For as little as a buck a month, you can be part of the coolest Facebook page on Facebook and have the opportunity to ask questions of our hosts on the shows. So there we go. I, oh, and I was going to say earlier, you know how uh, I, I mentioned last show that I'm like Ron Burgundy and I can only read what's in front of me on the teleprompter? Yes. Um, 
uh, my from in the intro that says where I'm from, like where I am right now, yeah. wasn't there. And I, I, it really threw me. I had to think about where I'm from. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what that little pause was. And, uh, yeah, I didn't have it scrolled down to training tips, so I just uh, drew a blank. Uh, <laughs> um, but the training tip is based off of um, – I was, I'm in a little private Facebook course group where they're giving training advice and everything, and someone had posted a video of a trainer wanting to know, hey, what do you think this person was recommended to me? And um, uh, I noticed something very interesting in the video, and it's a common thing that I see that people do with their horses and something I thought was worth addressing. And um, so in the video, she's standing on this, horse that she started, which that's a whole can of worms, probably won't go into why do you stand on horses, is it just showboating, or is it is it something practical that's good for my horse, um, but that's a whole other conversation. So she's standing on the horse, and then she uh, crouches down, gets off the horse's back, and then the horse pins its ears at her, and she pops it in the face for doing that, and she even put in the Facebook post, um, he gave me attitude, so I disciplined him. Um, and, and that really caught me because uh, I, I see that a lot. Uh, someone reads something the horse is doing, whether it's an expression on their face or some behavior, and they automatically assume my horse is giving me attitude and I need to punish. And the punishment is usually something like, I'm going to bop you in the face, I'm going to jerk on your lead rope, I'm going to make you back up, I'm going to yell at you, or whatever. Um, So several things, several observations there. First of all, when a horse pins its ears at me, um, aside from if my life is in immediate danger, like if the horse is pinning its ears at me and charging, uh, I need to to act fast. And, uh, um, but, but other than that, when when a or, when a horse does something, uh, makes a nasty face, pins its ears. Instead of automatically assuming the worst, my horse is giving me quote unquote attitude. Uh, they're misbehaving. They're being bad, um, and just going right to a physical punishment. Uh, I ask myself, what's with the pinning of the ears? What's going on? Am I doing something? Am I using too much pressure? Are you in pain? Um, what's happening? Why are you pinning your ears? And I don't do that because I'm overly sentimental and I just want my horse to feel wonderful and fluffy and great all the time. Uh, and I don't do it, uh, I don't stop and question because I'm afraid to punish. But a lot of times um, we will perceive a, a kind of a, what I would call a nasty face, horse pinning its ears, uh, maybe crinkling its nose giving you a really hard eye, we we automatically jump to the conclusion that, oh, this horse is giving me attitude. But a lot of times that's just not the case. So in this context, she's standing on the horse's back, jumps to the ground. That's going to be uncomfortable for a horse. Um, you're standing on their spine. You shift your weight in an odd way. It's not the same as sitting on their back. Uh, the balance is completely different. And when you jump to the ground, you're going to make them feel uncomfortable. And so that, to me, was exactly why I thought, okay, he didn't like that. He pinned his ears. Um, second of all, the the timing of the punishment, um, that kind of, you know, looking at the horse and then bopping him in the face, that's not going to be effective at all. Um, the horse likely doesn't know what the heck you're whooping up on him for. Um, so, you know, pinning the ears could be a sign of discomfort. It could be a sign of pain. It could be fear. It could be defensiveness. It could be frustration because you've done something, added too much pressure or are confusing them. Um, so, so that's basically the gist of what I'm getting at is instead of automatically putting a, um, an assumption on a behavior, first ask why. Why is this happening? Now, if your horse is biting or kicking you, you know, you don't have time to sit and analyze. You need to do something. You need to get out of the way, protect yourself, whatever. But other than that, you know, I, I really encourage people to sit down and think about why this is happening. And you may decide, okay, we have a problem with this. 
um, and I need to address it in the future with discipline, and that's fine. But don't automatically jump to the conclusion that, oh, my horse has given me attitude. That's putting a lot of human emotion onto horse behavior. Um, horses, only, you know, they, they react to what's happening in the moment. They're not, you know, we'll say, oh, he's being grumpy today, or oh, he's taking advantage of me today. Um, they don't sit in their stalls at night and, you know, like rub their hooves together and wonder, <laughs> what can I do to really make my owner's day hell? Um <gasps> So, so it's a very simple training concept, you know, always ask why, what's happening, find the reasoning behind it before you act. Yeah, do a little investigation. Something I'm curious about, because, and this you're probably going to ask because you've done liberty work with horses. When you watch horses working at liberty, there is a whole range of facial expressions that you see, including lots of ears getting pinned and wrink, nose wrinkled, and then ears go up and ears go side, ears go all over the place. Um, Talk to me a little bit about why you see that, because obviously when a horse is working at liberty, he can make the choice to leave. <laughs> he can make the choice to not do what you're asking, et cetera, et cetera. So he has chosen to follow the cues, yet we still get that wide range of expressions versus the, quote, relaxed expression that everybody thinks that, you know, the horse should always have that relaxed, happy expression. Yet we see that full wide range why is that? Um, that is actually a perfectly timed question because I've been working with my um, Kentucky Mustang makeover horse, Sage, at Liberty, and she has recently begun pinning her ears and giving me ugly face when I call her to me. Um, and, uh, um, you know, this, and that's another reason why I really thought about this training tip. Um, I haven't uh, addressed it with any kind of quote unquote discipline yet because I don't know why, what's happening there. And this is a question I've been asked a lot and I've seen, I, I've asked myself a lot when you see this beautiful, magical liberty session out in a big, spacious pasture between a trainer and a horse. Like you said, the horse obviously has the appearance of a choice that they, they could run away if they didn't want to be here. Um, so why are they pinning their ears? Uh, so I don't have a finite answer because I'm still wondering that myself, uh, but I have several theories, and I don't think any one theory will apply to across the board to every Liberty horse. Um, so one theory I would have is uh, I work around cow horses a lot, and I've worked cattle um, a time or two, and when a horse, especially a horse that really has a lot of cow to him, is on a cow, They'll often pin their ears. And so I've, I've wondered, is the same mechanism going on in Liberty? Because in Liberty work... He's so tracking you. following oh, you, rating yeah. you, um, staying right up to you, just like he would working a cow. Interesting. So I'm wondering if the pinning ears is more of a focus thing than a, I'm really grumpy and I'm about to kill you. Yeah, an aggression, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um so that is one theory, and I've heard uh, famous natural horsemanship trainers kind of explain away the pinning ears with that. Um, I think it's a very valid theory. Again, I don't know for sure if that's what's going on or if that's what's going on in every Liberty horse you see. Um, the second thing I think about a lot, because I'm not, I'm not really a Liberty trainer. I don't go on the road doing magical Liberty acts. I don't work in the circus. It's just my little fun plot project that I play with and seeing how far I can get with my horses doing it. Um, and, and so um, uh, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Your second theory next, about why they pin their ears. Yes, yeah, second theory about why they pin their ears. So um, it looks like the horse has choice when you see a lot of this these videos. Um, sometimes you'll see it in, a, like I said, a beautiful, magical, spacious pasture in the mountains, um, or in a, at least a very large arena to show, hey, if this horse didn't want to be with this trainer, they wouldn't be here. They, they can't be unhappy. Um, I don't think that's true, to be bluntly honest. Uh, I think some liberty programs, and I don't know if this will make me friends or enemies, I think some liberty programs are closer to um, an abusive relationship 
that like you have with your internet. Exactly. It's yes. That abusive lifetime movie boyfriend that your mother warned you about. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so it looks like the horse has choice. They're in a big space. They could leave if they wanted. Um, you know, y- you you look at everyone who's been in a troubled relationship right like that. You, she could leave if she wanted. Why doesn't she just leave him? You know, why why is she why is she putting up with this? Well, if you're with someone who says, no matter where you go, I will find you and I will make your life hell. A lot of people in those relationships just go, you know what? I'm safer staying. I don't know. I don't want to know what the consequences are going to be if I leave. And so I I know that there's um, there's a thought of. I'm going to make my horse feel comfortable with me, and I'm going to put pressure on them away from me. And that is not inherently bad. You want to make the right thing easy, the wrong thing difficult. That's a backbone of, backbone of a lot of horsemanship programs. But I think it can tip over into the edge of that horse is only there because it's going to be worse for them if they're not. And so I think pinning ears, nasty face can be residual effects of that. Can you, Uh, do you think, do you think that the horse's innate personality type, like some horses are naturally alphas, some horses are by nature um, followers, some horses by nature are high energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that can play into it as well? Whereas if you have a horse that's a high energy alpha type, he wants to be in charge and he wants to be in charge all the time. He's being asked to, or being told, whichever way you look at it, to follow the human, the trainer, because the trainer is in charge. So he's going to be making the the mean face because in his heart of hearts, he really wants to be the guy in charge. But he has learned that, now that's not going to work. I have to follow the trainer's instructions, but I do have the ability to make a mean face about it. Could Could that explain some of the times that you get you get that reaction from horses who are being worked off lead yet and they comply yet make mean face i don't know i'm t- i'm grasping at straws and i'm curious yeah yeah well and that's that's why this question is so brilliant is i don't think there is one answer and i think that is a completely valid opinion i i do think there are horses who they're just so glad someone's there to tell them what to do. Like, yes. oh, God, I was panicking. <laughs> You'll see this in a lot of horses that uh, pace on the trail or go to horse shows and call out and scream out and are just nervous wrecks all the time. Um, many times those horses are just begging, someone please help me out of this. It's like if I'm in a burning building and um, – everything's on fire and there's no way out. I'm going to be running around like a panicked fool. But if someone with authority comes in, a fireman busts in with an ax and says, follow me, I'm going to be able to snap to action and focus because thank God someone who knows what they're doing is here. So I think you have horses like that. And then I think you have horses who um, are, they, yeah, they want to pull the strings. They want to be the one to move your feet. And when you come and say, no, no, I'd rather you move your feet in the way that I would like. Um, I have a YouTube video to put out. You better look good for me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's entirely possible that the horse is like, well, I'm used to being the one that does this. And you're, you know, you've, you've, uh, you've decided you're going to be the one that does it. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do it. But I just want you to know I'm not happy about it. <laughs> Um, entirely possible. And, you know, there's, there's so much, there's so many factors playing in. I think another, um, another factor that plays in is something I see when I start colts. Uh, I will ride a lot of colts in the round pen for a few rides. And the first ride goes brilliant. Second ride goes just exactly how I imagined it would. And then what I'll often see, if you don't get out of the round pen soon enough, is third ride, the horse kicks out or pins its ears, swishes its tail, doesn't want to go forward anymore, maybe even throws in a buck or two. And, man, that's such a surprise because your first two rides were brilliant. Well, I've learned through experience that that horse needs to get out of the round pen. You've cooped them up in a small 50-foot diameter space. You've made them do lots of small circles. 
and that is very difficult for horses to do, especially young, unconditioned horses. If you do it too much, you can cause health and physical issues down the road. And that horse needs to go out and find some straight lines and go. And you'll see an immediate change in your horse. They get automatically happier, forward, freer. You'll get rid of a lot of that little crow hopping or kicking up. Um, So when I see a horse do that and they start to get real, when I'm riding around um, and they start to get real grumpy and pissy and I can't get them to move and they're swishing their tail and kicking out, that tells me you need to get out. We need to go down the trail. We need to hit a field and gallop and go. Um, and with Liberty, uh, unless you're on a four-wheeler, <laughs> you're not doing a lot of that distance work. You're doing circle, 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 circle. And I, I think that is another factor is that horse is like, I have circled you 300 million times. Haven't you gotten your brilliant YouTube video up yet? Do we have to keep doing this? <laughs> I'm sore. This is hard on my hocks. I don't like it. So, yeah, yeah, that's another thing. So, and it's okay. mentally, it's got to be tedium as well as physically. It is. Sure. Yes. That's yes. interesting. I know um, when I went and learned a little bit about Liberty from Tommy Turvey, who does quite a bit of it, um, he doesn't go and work on Liberty or anything, any of his tricks for like, it's not like we're going to bow for an hour today. We're going we're gonna to work on our Liberty circles for half an hour. He does five minutes and he's out. Now, he may do that several times a day, Mm -hmm. but, you know, uh, when I went over there, he told me, he said, now, you're going to get your money's worth, but I'm going to tell you, we're not going to work your horse, like, throughout the day. We're going to work my horses. You're going to see this. You're going to see this. He says, I don't do that to, you to to, like, screw you over. It's because your horse is not going to be able to handle that much mentally. And so when he does Liberty... He will start quiet, start the session with quiet, and then he'll bring up the intensity, put a little pressure on the horse. What are you going to do if there's pressure? Because we're going to have to do this in a show in front of people, so let's work in that pressure. And then he brings the horse back down again, works calmly, and then he's done, puts him up. And this might be a five- or ten-minute session, and so he doesn't drill, 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 drill on that. And I think that's been my issue in the past is I want it to be good. I have to work on it for a long time. But, again, you're doing tiny, tiny little circles. That is very difficult on a horse. Very interesting. So this, of course, leads me having the background I do in primarily English disciplines, how often we are told especially at clinics, when you go to a riding clinic, you hear this a lot. My horse has X, Y, or Z bad habit when we're working. He crow hops, he switches leads, he anticipates extensions, he um, he gets bulky at oxers, all sorts of things. And the clinician says, get your horse out of the ring. You know, just get him out of the ring, regardless of what you're doing, because both mentally and physically, they can call on different sections of their brain and different sections of their body and give them both a little bit of a breather. And it also gives the rider a breather, whether they realize it or not. So that's very interesting. So uh, it'll, it'll be fun as you play around with Sage to see what sort of liberty horse she is and what her favorite expressions are it would be interesting to do a little bit of a a survey with them and kind of take notes on what type of personality they have uh and what types of expressions they use facial expressions they use with different types of requests when you're doing liberty because when you're doing liberty i'm assuming there's certain skills that everybody has to have it's kind of like every horse has to learn how to stop go turn left, turn right. Every Liberty horse needs to learn how to come to you and go away from you and turn and things like that. It would be interesting to to, uh, do a little survey with that. Now you got me, my gears going. And this is, this goes back to the original intent of my training tip is that's how you're supposed to, that's, that's how I wish people and myself too. I'm not, I'm not uh, innocent of, of jumping to conclusions or getting frustrated with my horses, but instead of your horse gives you a problem instead of going, well, gosh, darn it, don't give me attitude. I'm so frustrated with you. I just wanted to come out here and ride, and you're causing all sorts of problems. Instead, think, hmm, how interesting. Approach it like a scientist. 
something has happened. I've observed an interesting behavior. Why might that be? And you're going to form a hypothesis based on your knowledge and experience. And then you're going to test that hypothesis and say, okay, is it this? Do you need a better saddle fit? Um, Are you sore? Did I skip something in your training? And instead of that feeling like this long, frustrating, tedious process, it's just another way for you to get to know your horse better, for you to know yourself better, for you to develop as a horseman, because that's what we're all trying to do. There we go. And speaking of developing as horsemen, we're going to give our first guest, Carly Wilcox, a call. And Carly gets to be called live on the air because we're a two-woman show today. And she had a listener question. Let's see if Skype does its job or if it just turns away from Hello? us and makes a mean face. There's Carly! Hi, sorry. <laughs> uh, Welcome to the show, Carly. Hi. How you doing? I am good. Got so coffee in hand. Coffee in hand. You're ready to go. I'm ready. What, what part of the world are you hanging out in right now, Carly? Mesa, Arizona. Oh, so you were up early. Thank you. Oh, I know. There you go. <laughs> so for, so for new listeners, because, because occasionally we do have new listeners to this show, uh, give everybody the Reader's Digest of Carly's Horsey Self. Oh, good Lord. That's... that's... That's a long story, but um, I, I started riding um, horses bare back when I was wee little, um, and then from there on, I started showing Arabian horses, and then got out of the show business and bought my own pony on Facebook for four hundred dollars. No background whatsoever, green broke, and he's he's my little angel, and so now we're we're diving into the world of vaquero horsemanship and working with this. Garrocha pole that Mary has subjected me to. <laughs> oh, and you can I mean, roll your uh, R's. I'm so jealous. <laughs> I don't know why you're jealous. I'm the one who's going to be jealous because I have barely even <laughs> touched the surface. <laughs> um, so I'm going to butcher the words. So you've been working with a garrocha with your pony, um, and you're working with a new trainer. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And uh, what is a garrocha for people who don't know? So I, I honestly, I have no idea, like, how I got into this, but it just kind of fell in my lap. Um, but so that the the trainer that I'm going to be working with, his name is Manuel uh, Trico, I think is how you pronounce it. I think the G is silent in a way. Anyways. Um, so he does a lot of Doma Vaquera, a lot of Garrocha um, uh, training work. He's from Andalusia, Spain. And so we're going to be working with him on lightness and working off the seat to less on the hand. Um, so I have yet to take my lessons from him, but we're doing it in June. We're conversing and trying to get things set up. But so he does the work with the garrocha pole. What the garrocha pole is, it's a 13 foot wooden pole. And the Doma Vaquera cowboys in Spain use the 13 foot pole to keep a solid distance away from these bulls that they breed for bullfighting. And so they, they use them to guide them, to hurt them, and also to test their uh, bravery by poking them with a stick a little bit. So. <laughs> It also like it I and I told one of my friends who doesn't know anything about horses, um, she's like, Why do you need a thirteen foot pole? I was like, Well, if I wanna know that my circles are circles, use a thirteen foot pole. Stick it in the ground and see if you can make a good circle. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It it will uh it will make you uh question your, your horsemanship because you're like, Yeah, I could totally do circles and uh then you put the oh, pole yeah. in the ground and try to ride around it and you're like, No, I d I don't know what circles are. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, so you I were guess, wondering about introducing the garrocha to your pony, is that correct? Yes. Exactly. Um, Cuz I mean there's there's introducing it and then there's shoving it in its face and going all right, get used to it. <laughs> so I'd like to learn yeah. the proper way. <laughs> well, that is one way, but uh, yeah, you'll find uh, it looks good on paper, and then you realize that mm, you're holding something that your horse is possibly afraid of, and maybe he doesn't neck ring yet, and, but you only have one hand to maneuver him with, um, so it can get pretty scary pretty quick. 
if you're not uh, prepared. Um, so the way that I learned, and I will do a little product plug, um, uh, I learned from, so actually I taught myself on YouTube <laughs> and then I, I started doing Garocha for, um, Mustang makeover freestyles because it does show, uh, a degree of difficulty. I'm riding this horse one handed. I'm maneuvering this heavy object. I'm showing you how perfect my circles are. My horse can turn under the pole and maneuver sideways and do leg yields. Um, it's really great if you want to uh, sharpen up your dressage, uh, put it to the test with the pole. It's, it's, uh, and plus it just looks super cool when you do it. Um, <laughs> but I taught myself on YouTube and did a couple of performances, and it was really popular. And all of a sudden I had people saying, will you do a clinic? Will you do lessons? Can I come over and learn it from you? And yada, yada, yada. And um I am not one to pretend I know something that I don't and go, yeah, I'm an expert. Uh, yeah, I grew up in Spain, and I totally know what I'm doing. Um, so I wanted to share it with people, but I wanted to really say, okay, I need to learn the basics, so I'm giving people correct information. So I actually flew to California and rode with a gentleman who's been on the show named John St. Ryan, and he's fantastic if you're in the southern california area i totally recommend looking him up and riding with him he's got a wealth of knowledge of doma vaquera and natural horsemanship and all sorts of things and he's got a great dvd on introducing garocha um so i will paraphrase what i learned from him and in the dvd in that um first It's obviously helpful if your horse has been previously sacked out to things, meaning you can rub him all over with something like a flag or a whip and he doesn't try to kick it out of your hands. Um, so, So a basic knowledge of desensitization techniques for your horse will go quite a long way. Um... And then when it comes time and I'm ready for the pull, I will get the pull out. And you can either have someone hold your horse if it's too awkward because it is a 13-foot-long wooden pole, uh, or you can hold them yourself. Uh, I keep the rein loose but not so loose that if he turns around and kicks, uh, I don't have any control over where he moves his feet. And I will rub him all over his body with a pole, especially over the top line. I like to go over the rump and down the back legs. I use a firm, I I really kind of press that pole into them. I don't want to tickle him with it. Um, And I keep it close to them um, at all times. And I do that on the ground, just make sure, okay, you're not terrified. If, If you come at him with the pole and they start running sideways, it's a good indication you're not ready to ride with it yet. (laughs) But you could take that risk if you wanted. Um, (laughs) Now let's say your horse is pretty good with that, but you're just not ready to make the leap to getting in the saddle, putting the reins in one hand, trying to maneuver the pole, and get your horse used to it. Um, A fantastic way to do this, and this is what I do in all my clinics, to double-check before I hand someone a pole, is... I will have a helper, or I usually am the one to do this, but you can have a helper stand in the middle of the arena holding the pole straight up and down. Um, So they're holding the pole vertically, and you ride circles around them. And your horse will tell you immediately how comfortable they are with getting close. You may have to start out with like a large 20-meter circle and work your way in. Um, The number one rule of this is the person with the pole is never to come at you with the pole. You make the decision of how close you're going to get, and your horse is going to help you make that decision. You're the one to approach and retreat, not them. They just stand there. So I'll circle around the pole both ways. I always, when I change directions, I always turn into the pole, not away from it. Always turn into a scary object. Never turn away from it. Um, That's just a good general rule. Um, and so I will, I will do that several times until I feel, okay, my horse is okay with this. Then what I will do is I'll have the handle lower the pole and hold it in a position that will be similar to how I will carry it, and you can continue circling. And this time when you turn into the pole, you'll actually be turning your horse under the pole because the pole is now slanted, kind of like at a 45-degree angle. So your horse is going to get used to that pole going above their eyes and ears where they can't see it. Um, Then you can have the person lower the pole and gently rub the horse as they go around. They can rub them across the top of the neck, over the rump, um, and just let them get a feel for it. 
Now, at any time, uh, let's say something happens and your horse goes, game over, man, I've got to clock out. Well, you've got two hands on the reins, and you have full control, so you can ride away from it. Don't be afraid to say, we've got to get out of the situation. Ride away from it. Let your horse settle, then come back. You're not going to teach your horse that it's okay to be scared or that running away is good. You just take a hold of the situation before it gets crazy and say, hey, we're going to ride over here now. Ride away, get your horse back, and then approach it again. You can do that approach and retreat several times. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I'll do, uh, and I've had some horses where it took me about half an hour of doing this. Um, before I could hand that rider the pole. Uh, You're better off, if it takes a few days, you're better off doing that than grabbing a hold of it, having a wreck, and now you're really going to have a hard time getting your horse to trust you again. Um, But usually, after I do all that, with very few exceptions, um, I can have the handler then hand me the pole, and I can start... um, I can start, you know, doing my maneuvers with it. Uh, Another thing that a lot of people really fret about, they'll sign up for a clinic. The clinic may be only one or two days, and the horse doesn't neck rein, and they're freaking out, you know, I'm not going to have time to do the pull because I have to teach my horse to neck rein. Um, A brilliant thing about this tool is it will actually teach your horse to neck rein. Um, I've had horses that after two days doing a grocery clinic are riding around one-handed like pros. And I think the big reason for that is for some reason the horse, I find every horse I've introduced the grocery to, once you show them the maneuvers, they understand the rules of the game really quick. And they're like, oh, I need to keep the pole here. Or when you lift the pole like this, I'm to go under it. Or when you do this, I'm to side pass. Or I'm to, they really, it's like cow work. It gives your horse a sense of purpose. It's brilliant, actually. Um, and the other reason that it's great to teach your horse to handle one-handed is it takes your mind off your horse. You're worried about, oh, man, that pole's dragging around. I need to tighten my circle. I need to do this. And you're concentrated on the pole, too, so you're not in your horse's face micromanaging or worrying about, oh, he tipped his head up or he counterbent or this and that and the other. Um, it's just something to draw both of your focus onto a common goal, and uh, it, it tends to work brilliantly. In fact, I always joke the two, horse, the two Mustangs that I did it with, I actually did the pole bridleless, and I've had people go, how long did you teach your horse, how long did it take you to teach him to ride bridleless? I'm like, um, in the shoulder, because the <laughs> horse knew when I set the pole in the ground, oh, yeah, we're going to do circles, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do this. I didn't actually have to teach him how to ride bridleless. They just followed the pole. Um, I had one horse that when I lifted the pole up, I had no steering anymore. But when I put it on the ground, he steered beautifully. (laughs) (laughs) So does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yes. Awesome. Good. Well, I'm really excited to hear how it goes with your new trainer. I think that kind of... Um, that discipline is incredibly fascinating. If people uh, are still like, what the heck is this pole? Why is this such a big deal? I totally encourage you to YouTube it and check it out. Um, you could just uh, type in Doma Vaquera or Garocha pole. I like to include uh, the word horse in there so that you don't get pole balls <laughs> that can come up. Um, and definitely check it out. So thank you so much for your question. I think it's brilliant, and definitely keep us updated on how your lessons go. Definitely. Will do. Thanks, Carly. That was fascinating. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Now, see, now I've got all kinds of ideas to try because my circles aren't very much like circles. My circles are like potatoes. So now I'm going, oh, I can make my circles rounder. What a fascinating way to help the horse and rider both figure out circle. Ooh, I like it. Oh, the garoch is the funnest thing ever. I call it my substitution for cow work because for a lot of cowboys or performance horse trainer, working your horse on a cow and giving them a reason, you'll just like with the garocha, you'll find your maneuvers aren't as good as you think they are when you have to have a purpose. Like if you have to stop a cow on the fence, you'll realize, oh, my brakes weren't as uh, as great as I as thought. As great as you thought, yeah. And it, 
it's a fun job for your horse. It's a fun job for you. Um, but we can't all go get a herd of cows or go out onto a Texas ranch and work cattle. So a 13-foot closet dowel from Home Depot will do very much the same thing. So a closet dowel is, a, is of appropriate diameter. Okay. That was my, that was yeah, well, one of my questions. Well, there's several different diameters. I get the thinnest one I can manage because um, I've worked with real poles, real grocha poles from Spain. They're really heavy. Yeah. Um, so I was able to find one at Home Depot that's like, I think it's like an inch and a quarter. Mm-hmm. Um, and I try to get the thinnest diameter I can find. Uh the, another great substitute if you're just starting out and you're like, wow, I have rota- rotator cuff injury or this or that, the other, I can't carry a heavy wooden pole, is get a, um, it's a paint roller handle that you use to like wallpaper ceilings. Um, you oh. can get them at Lowe's Home Depot. Yeah, and a lot of them are telescopic. So when I do clinics, I can't haul. <laughs> lumber you can't, can't check a garrocha trailer. pole. <laughs> Yeah, it's not going to work. So I buy a mess of those. Um, they're super light. You could drop them on your horse's head, and he'll probably forgive you. That's um, brilliant. <laughs> they're super cheap. They're like 13 bucks. The only problem with those is uh, when you're doing garrocha, the weight really helps you to do a lot of the maneuvers. But this is a great way to start. If you're intimidated about maneuvering a really heavy piece of lumber, um, it's a great way to start. It's cheap. It's portable. Uh, I like so it. So definitely check out, check those out. I like it. That's awesome. Well, that was a fascinating. My brain is overflowing right now. So I think what we're going to do know. is take a quick break and hear from our sponsor, Horseware, and then maybe a little bit of Templeton Thompson. And then when we get back, uh, we've got Jerry Jones on cow training and more questions. In the world of horse racing and elite equestrian sports, it's all about how to prepare and repair. Ice Vibe is a truly portable and highly efficient circulation therapy system for your horse. Before activity, prepare to prevent damage by using the Ice Vibe's vibration pads. Repair after the event by using the unique combination of cold packs and vibration to minimize swelling and encourage blood flow. And because it's battery powered, Ice Vibe is truly portable. The essential and affordable tool to prepare and repair ice vibe you can find out more details about ice vibe at ice-vibe.com or horseware.com or ask your local tax shop or online supplier for more information about ice vibe circulation therapy from horseware
That's Templeton Thompson. You can find all of her music at templetonthompson.com. She's got a heap of it there. Did you know that she just did a a duet with Michael Martin Murphy? Ooh, very yeah. cool. If you don't know who Michael Martin Murphy is, the song Wildfire that we were all bonkers about, I believe that was the late 70s. That's Michael Martin Murphy. So I encourage you to go to templetonthompson.com and check it all out. And you are listening to Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network, and I'm here with Mary Kitzmiller. And Mary Kitzmiller stops by once a month on the second Thursday, and we get to geek out on horse training. Lots of fun. So we have time for one more li- quick listener-submitted question before we get our guest, Jerry Jones, on cow training. I can't. I keep saying Jerry Jones on cow training because I just have this vision of training a cow. Um, <laughs> I'm not. I'm pretty um, sure that's not what it is, but that's keep what I think of. So, what is going to be our Reader's Digest quickie question before we chat with Jerry? Okay, uh, so I had two questions on this, um, and it's target training, um, which is an exercise often used as a foundation exercise in clicker training or positive reinforcement training. Um, so. Real quick, uh, the questions are, what is target training? Someone said, I'm, um, ah, I want to hear about the target thing for clicker training. What is it? How do I use it? I think it's been on a past episode. Happy to listen to it there, too. Um, and then someone else wanted to know about using a cue for target training. Target training is what I call a gateway exercise for clicker training, to teach the horse what the click means. And uh, in clicker training, for me, the click means, yes, you did something great. You should do that again in the future. I need to teach my horse that the click means yes, and the click means they're going to get a reward, they're going to get a cookie, they're going to get a scratch, um, or whatever. Uh, I like target training because it's a very simple job. You're teaching your horse to touch their nose to an object, so they're targeting that object. Uh, but it's got many other uses as well. Again, I use target training as uh, the gateway, a simple job to teach my horse what the click means. But you can use it for so many things. I use it to teach my Z-Donk Z, who's very fearful of the halter. I use it to teach her to lead because the halter is too much pressure for her. She can follow the target around and stay by my side, and it's a fun job for her to do to earn rewards. So it's a great thing for liberty training as well. I use target training for my horse Guthrie when we tackle obstacles. Instead of fearing new obstacles now, he loves to go up to them and touch them with his nose. And that is a way, it's it's a fun game that he's learned that if I'm brave and I approach things with curiosity and wonder, I get rewarded for it. So that makes them even uh, more fun. A cautionary Um, note here, caution, asterisk, when you teach your horse that, when you go out for a hack around the neighborhood and it's trash day, your horse will insist upon touching every single trash can in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> but that's better than spooking at every single trash can in the neighborhood, which we know is very possible. <laughs> yeah, that's that. I, this, that's just really funny. And you're right. It, it's a fun way to, especially for horses who are not by nature curious and a lot of people reserve these types of training techniques and these kinds of exercises for horses who are fearful of objects. But I also discovered um, that they're great for horses who are dull, who don't have a whole lot of, they're not really spooky, but they're not really curious either. They just kind of go along in life, blah, blah, blah. It will help spark them mentally. And it, it livens them up mentally a little bit, which in turn is going to make them a little more lively with your physical aids as well. So I found it an interesting way to help Nigel, come out of his what I call his zombie phase because he tends to be sort of zombie like when he's um at home and then he's freaked out when he's not away from home so he's it's the two faces of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde it helps him a little bit be a little curious because he goes well I wonder I wonder what I could do to perhaps get a reward because rewards are cool I like rewards and he will he will sometimes volunteer a habit or he'll go, oh, this is fun to learn because I'm going to get rewards. So don't don't reserve it for just the spooky, goofy ones. Yeah, it's a great way to put some sparkle back in your horse's eye and get them excited about work. And I find the effects of that is not just because my horse is working for a cookie. 
um, there's something about it that just turns on all those seeking systems in their brain and makes them excited to go out and explore their environment. Word of warning, even if your horse loves to target and approach um, things, use some common sense. I don't let my horses, I'm very careful with letting my horses touch things that crinkle like tarps or bags. They might think it's great, and then they touch it. It makes a noise they didn't expect, and now they, they've got an aversive reaction um, for feeling brave and approaching something. So, you know, I will hold my horses up um, on certain things that either they haven't been introduced to yet or I just don't know what their reaction is going to be, and I never let my horses bite things. I don't want them to bite on a tarp or a trash bag or anything like that. So, you know, just use some common sense. Don't let them just touch things willy-nilly with their nose. Yes, um, yes. So that's a great uh, that's a great use for it. Um, so many other uses. You can use targeting to, to teach your horse to accept a bridle to put their nose in a halter. I use it to teach my horse to fetch things. Um, so there's a ton, a ton of uses. Uh, uh, I can't get into all the ways in which you could do it. But once you start doing it, your imagination goes wild, and you find there's all sorts of great uses for it. So how do you teach it? Um, incredibly brief lesson, um, but... I do this um, with most horses, unless they're extremely fearful or wild, uh, is I have my bag of cookies that are going to be my reward. I have my clicker. I have my target. If it's a horse I don't know or has pushy or aggressive issues, um, just any horse in general, it's a good rule of thumb to put a barrier between you and the horse, like a fence um, or a stall guard or something. So if my horse gets too excited, I don't get run over, and I don't have to worry about disciplining my horse while trying to get him to be curious. That's very difficult to do. Um, I present the target to my horse. Uh, I like to use, I have a little buoy um, on a stick. You can use a Nerf ball on a stick. I like something that is, A, not going to be too scary, so nothing too crinkly, um, and B, something that my horse doesn't already see in his environment. So don't use a whip. Um, I want him to think a whip is a whip and a target is something for something else. So I don't want him to get confused about what the object is. So I try to find a whole new object. Um, you can use a tiny road cone, uh, just something that's not too scary but is novel looking to the horse, uh, easy for them to spot. Uh, I place it in front of them, and then when they touch it, I click and then treat and I'll do that over and over again for about five minutes. You don't really want to hang in there for any more than five minutes, even if your horse is having the time of his life. You want to leave him wanting more. Um, and when you do that over and over and over again, he'll start to draw the conclusion, hey, every time I touch this, I hear an odd noise, and then I get cookies. I wonder what happens if I keep touching it. Um, it usually takes a few sessions. I've never had a horse completely get it in one session. I've had a lot that just looked like they had it brilliant, and then the next session they had no idea what we were doing. So uh, I always do it at least a few sessions, to, and I observe what the results afterwards. Did he understand the point of the game? Is he hearing the click? Does he know the click means reward? Um, and someone else asked about putting a cue to it. I don't put a cue to it uh, when I'm using a target, uh, but it is a good idea because it'd be nice to, for your horse to know what is okay to approach and touch and what is not. So, for instance, um, I could easily run into this problem with Guthrie, my horse who loves to touch obstacles. I tend to let him approach and touch anything and say, that was great, and reward him. But what happens when I go to a horse show and instead of going across the trail course fluidly, he stops and touches everything before he performs it. Um, that might be an issue. <laughs> there you go. So putting a key to it is a good idea. You can say the word target. You can say the word touch. A voice cue would probably be the best thing. It could be any word you want. It could be the word banana. Um, <laughs> someone has some questions about that. <laughs> And in clicker training, I tend to get the behavior first, either through shaping or capturing, and then I add the cue later. So I'll get the horse consistently touching the target. They know that when you put the target in front of their nose, they're meant to touch it. They know that when they hear the click, they've done a good job, and they know that the click means yes, and I'm going to get cookies now. When you get the, all that working for you, then what I'm going to do is I'm not going to give the cue before I present the target, I'm going to give it to them while they're touching the target. So that's a little bit different than a lot of us are used to in horse training. So I'm going to wait 
until my horse's nose makes contact with the target and I'll say touch and do it in like a crisp, you know, unique tone that is not going to be muddled with any other words you might be saying. Um, and I'll do that several times in a row and then I'll start pushing that cue back a little bit. I'll start saying it as they're going to touch it and then they about a second or two before they touch it and I'll do that many, many times until I can finally give the cue and wait for them to touch it. You don't want to do that too quickly because if you use a cue and then your horse does not do the behavior and you let this happen several times, that cue will lose power. It will never get consistent. You'll have to change cues. You'll have to come up with a new word and start again. And this works for almost anything you can teach. When I teach the lay down, I get the lay down to happen first. Then I reward it several times. And then I will wait till my horse's knees are buckling and he's about to hit the ground. And then I'll give the cue. You can, again, you can use a voice cue. You can use a gesture. Um, I made the mistake of lightly pinching my horse in front of the withers um, so I could do it from the saddle. And then my horse started laying down any time I rested my hand on their neck. So be careful what cue <laughs> you decide to use because <laughs> it'll get really consistent and uh, you don't want it to accidentally happen when you don't want it to. <laughs> There we go. Target training 101. Uh, so we've got Jerry Jones with us today, who is a Western performance horse trainer, Mustang makeover veteran, and uh, apparently cow trainer now. Um, where are you calling from today, Jerry? <laughs> uh, I am in uh, a little town just outside of Bonham, Texas, uh, which is roughly about 50 miles east of Gainesville. Um, yep, no, we live up here and Little town called Ravenna, population 206. Oh, nice, nice. So um, you have an impressive resume. There's a wealth of knowledge on horses we could talk about. Uh, your experience with the Mustang makeovers, I believe you were just reserve champion last year. Was that right? Is that correct? I, I got third. Third, third place. Close. I was so close. What well, was very, very cool performance, very nice horse. Uh, but what really caught my interest so in the last few weeks was uh, you and your family, actually your daughter more than anyone can, now add cow trainer to your resume. Um, they put a cow on Facebook, and it blew up. It went pretty viral. and uh, The video the, blew up, people, not the cow. Take it easy. Yeah, no, no, the no cow emails. did not blow up. <laughs> It was a saddle train cow, and uh, it it uh, brought a lot of interest and and a lot of money at the sale. Um, so, uh, what made you guys decide you wanted to saddle train a cow? Um, you know, it, it's something that my wife had wanted to do. Um, we tried once before with a longhorn, and um, the the key to it is is getting them very young. You know, if you get them pretty young. Uh, they halt to break a little easier. They're, they don't have nearly as much power to kind of pull you around. They're not like a horse. The, unfortunately, a horse will learn more from the release of pressure. When you add pressure and you release it at the right time, the horse kind of picks up on that's the right answer. Um, cattle are a little different. You know, they don't have a lot of feel. They don't have a lot of uh, uh, movement. It's really a little bit different of, of a deal. They kind of um are just a little tougher so we tried it on a longhorn uh, my wife did and um didn't go very well the, it ended up getting a little sick and so we it didn't work out um we lost that one and so it just happened to be a fluke deal a neighbor of ours a cattle rancher you know backyard kind of a cattle rancher called us and said there was a calf on the ground the mama hadn't taken it in a couple of days and wouldn't take it and it was getting weak, and so we rushed over, picked it up, uh, actually loaded it in the back of our Chevy Tahoe, and brought it home. And uh, it was touch and go for a few days, and and uh, we ended up nursing it back. And my wife bottle fed it, and my, we've got pictures all the way from about three days old, two days old, up to today, present, present day, which is delivery day for him. He's going to his new home today. And uh, oh, very cool. So, you know. Yeah, no, as it went along, we just kind of, honestly, we just kind of call it tinker. And I don't know, we just tinkered around with it. And he accepted it pretty easy and was always obviously pretty gentle. So, 
That's about and it. And so you mentioned they're a little bit different from horses. Uh, they move differently to pressure. Um, so, so like, how do you get energy in a cow? I've seen people jumping cows. I've seen, you know, people yeah, riding longhorns. Yeah, it kind of depends on the breed, I think. You know, like those. I've seen a, a matter of fact, my neighbor had one of the n- number one rodeo acts and he did, uh, grammars and he, he Roman rode on them, jumped fire and all kinds of nonsense. And those things were galloping around. So I think what we found with the Norman, uh, which was uh, a Hereford cross, a little bit more of a colder breed. So if you're going to relate that to horses, maybe a little bit more like a draft horse or a, you know, like a halfling or some kind of a wagon pulling kind of a more of a pulling kind of a horse. And so what we're trying to do now is we're going to venture and try this again, but we're going to try it with a little bit hotter of a breed. And I don't know if it'll be any different. Um, Really what it boiled down to with that Norman calf was, you know, my wife bottle fed that thing and paint bottle fed that thing, which is my daughter um, every day, three times a day for, I don't know, forever, it seemed like. And so really what kind of, what what we did with him was we put that halter on. Well, that thing wanted to follow them around all the time, you know, anyway, because he thought he was going to get a bottle. Well, then we just carried that over into grain and feed and, and whatever that he liked at that moment. And pretty much, you know, we pretty much kind of did a, a whole whistle train. So we'd whistle to him, you know, and he'd come running and he, because we'd feed him. And uh, it just slowly progressed into that, you know. And uh, so training the cow and, and having to figure out how do we train a cow and, and obviously new territory, but did saddle training this cow, uh, cow teach you guys anything about horse training? Did it improve your horse program in any way? You know, I don't. I could say no, but I think any time you work with any animal, it'll teach you something because honestly I use horses. I also train cow dogs. Um, I guess, I guess we trained a calf. And so really in, in everything that you train, I think if I could say the number one thing that training animals teaches me, which is very hard for me because I'm a pretty high energy individual is patience. Uh, it has taught me patience with my children. It has improved my relationship with my wife, with other individuals. Um, it's brought me closer to my walk with God, um, which and I give all all things uh, glory to him, you know. Uh, it's only by his grace that I get to do what I do for a living, and it's it's just pretty miraculous that it's even that way. But, yeah, I would say probably patience would be, like, the number one thing that it taught us. I, I could see that. Um, and, and if you're ever looking for more projects, uh, have I got three for you? Um, have, <laughs> Two bottle baby dairy calves, a Jersey steer, which I have come to find out are the clowns of the cow world. Um, Among his interests are dumping over my 100-gallon water tank when it's only half full and then rolling it end over end across my 10-acre pasture. Um, And then a very uh, grumpy longhorn um, who who acts like a Spanish fighting bull sometimes. Um, Nice. Learned to break out of fences, which include breaking the welds, uh, and um, they like to bust the brand new gutters I installed on my arena, which caused it to flood. So um, I would say, if you're not interested in those fine prospects, um, do you have any tips for me to get started, <laughs> or is it a lost cause? Well, well, you know, and here's my only, my only thing that I have seen in the ranching industry is, and I've heard more about it than I've seen it, but I have seen it. Um, I would recommend that you uh, get you a little 20 cc's of cactus nylon. And, uh, and as the joke goes in the <laughs> ranching world, because basically what you can do is that'll improve your horsemanship, that'll improve you, and that'll improve your cattle. Because what happens then is, is that you can actually teach those cattle to lead. It sounds ironic, but it's you lead them from behind, but basically when they don't go where you like, you can tighten up your rope and dally up and uh, stop them and then redirect with the push again. And uh, a lot of those guys out West, or I've heard out West stories of those guys with their Corianni, uh livestock 
they would actually train those Corrienni, uh with a with a with a cactus rope. And so when they would need to get their bulls off the cattle, uh, you know, whenever they pulled their bulls, they would just go out there and rope them. Those things would lead all the way back to the barn, you know, and they didn't have to actually bring out a trailer or whatnot. So, yeah, you can do a lot of things with a rope. You know, we we start a lot of horses with ropes. You know, as you know, as you well know, with the Mustangs, uh, it's a sure easier to do. It's a sure easier job to do with a saddle uh, instead of on your feet. Oh yeah. So, oh yeah. Well, that'd be my really recommendation. Um, you know, uh, I saw Buck Brannaman essentially do that at a clinic. We were working this um, small little road deer of cattle, and one had kind of gotten off and run into the corner. And, of course, us students, uh, it was the first day. We weren't any good at getting it back. And so Buck just said, hey, everybody stand back. And from the center of the arena, threw a 60-foot rope, sailed over uh, into the corner of the arena and caught the caught the cow. And... You know, he didn't just like jerk the calf around and drag it oh, back no. to the ground. Oh, no, 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 yeah. No, he, that's, um, that's not necessary. Nope. Um, yeah, he started doing exactly like he would have done with the colt. He, you know, he brought his horse up, yielded the calf's hindquarters, and he was just he was just playing around. And he, you know, finally he looked at the crowd and he said, "So pretty much what I'm doing is I'm getting this calf halter broke," um, and. Uh, it exactly. just dawned on me. I was like, "Oh yeah, I guess you could do that. It's not just about chasing them down and throwing a rope at them for 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 kicks." Um, no, so, no, no, yeah. no. And what cool. what what makes me believe that that's a really good way of doing it is I went out with a buddy one time and we had heard about a cow had jumped the fence and had jumped several fences and so we went out and uh, obviously going through three or four different people's property to get it. Uh, we didn't have the option of running a trailer out there. And, and we literally, he roped it and we just, both of us kind of tracked that thing. And then honestly, I thought, man, it's going to take us two years to get that thing back. And, and in 15 minutes, that thing was leading like an old dairy cow. It was pretty amazing. So yeah, you know, they're just different. And the difference that I could mostly think of is they're so much thicker skin, which obviously we use them for belts and boots and whatever leather products you like come from cattle and so unless it's an imitation which i don't care for but the the point of it is is their skin is so thick and durable that the pressure that you add isn't felt as much as like a horse with a thinner skin you know and so when you do add pressure with a stick or your boot or your spur or your rein or whatever else which you know a horse can kind of feel a fly land on every square inch of his body and wiggle that one square inch where a cow you'll see a million flies on their back out in the pasture and they care less it seems you know and so that just tells you the difference of of sensitivity is is a completely different deal so you know it's just what it is but yeah no if i were you i'd i'd dang sure i'd experiment and play around with that rope and then like i said it'll improve you and it'll improve your cattle it'll improve your horsemanship it'll It'll do a lot for you. Very cool. Well, I'm super excited to uh, to try my hand at cow training. Now, I don't know if I could command the price that you guys got on yours. So you did a Facebook auction. Were you expecting? Um, what were you What were you hoping to get for your cow? And what did the the auction eventually close at? You know, honestly, I, in the back of my mind, I told my wife, I said, "Let's try it," and she said, "We're going to be the laughing stock of the internet." We, you know, we're we're out here training or trying to train and, and go show professionally in the cowards business. And uh, she's like, we're going to be the laughing stock. People are going to think we're crazy. And I was like, well, what do we got to lose? If it doesn't work, we can always take him, you know, we can keep him around or use him for whatever. And she said, okay. So she put it on there in a, in, in, in really didn't want to. And so it started out and, you know, we were kind of thinking, or I was thinking, Market value is probably a dollar thirty to a dollar fifty cents a pound, and he was in good, fed up shape, and you know he would have been a good one to go on and feed out and eventually eat, you know, if that was the case. Obviously, my wife would never allow that, although I joked about it all the time. And so we <laughs> kind of had it in our mind that uh, you know is that he would bring fifteen hundred maybe, and so when he was at like a thousand. Somebody was asking uh, my wife, hey, what would you take? What's the buy it now price? And she was like, 
should I tell him 3,500? And I was like, ah, just let it run. You know, we already started the auction. Just let it run. Man, that thing skedaddled and scoobied on up there to about 5,000. And I'm sitting here going, what? This has got to be a joke, right? Well, it ended up, um, I, which the, both ladies wanted to be anonymous. And so they gave me a name. I did use their city from where they were from. They had uh, some sort of, both of them, ironically, were from the same town. And I'm sitting there thinking, is this a scam? You know, is this can't be real. Uh, but they both had the same area code phone numbers. They go to tag teaming me $100 and $300 at a time. So not only was I bidding for them, both ladies, I was having to answer what the bid was at. And do you want to go to the next bid? And so I literally had to take off the whole day, didn't get one horse rode. <laughs> and I sat there and, and ping pong those two ladies back and forth. And, uh, yeah, he ended up going for $14,800. And I was, I, I honestly, I'm, I'm still blown away. I still can't believe it. Even though the money's been, has already been changed hands and he'll be delivered today at 11 o'clock and, I still can't believe it. I just, I don't believe it. But, you know, that's really what my wife dreamed for that little sucker because he was kind of a miracle calf. He was about to die, and we nursed him back, and he was kind of a family member. And honestly, the only reason that we really went as our, my thoughts is, you know, we do train, uh, uh, we use cattle all week long training our cow horses, and we cut on them until they're used up. And then when I say used up, they don't have a lot of movement left. And then we go on and take them down the fence. And we do that periodically all week long on top of teaching our horses terrain, which is, you know, the, the trifecta of my opinion of the cow, of the horse. It's kind of like a three day adventure, but in the Western world, we got three events to do um, over a period of a week and sometimes a little longer, you know, but uh, and, and the point of that story is, is the reason that we needed to get rid of him is because he was really kind of in the way. And we cycle our cattle out a lot, you know, so about once a month we cycle new cattle. And he was only effective for about a day to teach those cattle where to be. And then he's in the way because when we step in there, he's coming to us. And we're trying to cut the fresh ones. And so it was just kind of a a time where we just knew that it was time for him to go on and be enjoyed by another family or another business or another rodeo act or, you know, something. Um, we did our job. We felt like in, in a lot of ways, and that's kind of how we do things, you know, whether it be a Mustang or a calf or a, or a cow horse, we train them. We use our gifts to go on and let somebody else enjoy them. And that's, that's what it ended up. And, and my wife is extremely, my wife and daughter both are extremely excited that he gets to go on and maybe improve someone else's life. And then our story can hopefully uh, maybe bring someone a little closer to Christ. Um, and, and again, the people that are going to be affected by this calf are going to be, uh, drug addicts or PTSD, uh, military people, or, or those kind of deals where he's going to bring, maybe it's a disabled child or something to that effect. And if that, I mean, I almost get chills talking about it because that, that means a lot to me. That means, you know, something that we get to give back to the world instead of, you know, a lot of people in this day and time, it's just take, 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 take. What can you do for me? And I always kind of look at it, and my wife and my daughter, and that's kind of how we, we're trying to give a little piece of the Western heritage back to the world, if you might say. You know, a lot of crap going on in the world. Well, we want to give that back. And so that's what we try to do around here. We try to teach our children that. We try to, you know, we try to live that uh, to the best of our knowledge and the best of our ability. Sometimes it doesn't work. You know how life can be, and you can get down on yourself. And but ultimately, that's our that's our focus. You know, at this place, Jerry, I have Very one cool. one final, extremely important question. What okay. si- what size saddle tree do you use on a a cow? You know, you know, we started, and I'd say probably on the first time. Good Lord, I don't know. It was a youth like a baby youth saddle. It wasn't even a saddle that nearly would fit a horse. So when we started, you know, their backs are a lot more flat, no withers. That saddle will want to creep up on their head. Technically, you could use more like a croup, like you would on a mule. Uh, That sure wouldn't hurt things. Um, 
at the end of it, at his weight, I'd say he's probably roughly around 800 pounds. I was I rode him on one of our videos. I called it trying to blend in. So training those cow dogs, um, those cattle are pro- or those dogs are programmed to bring cattle to you or push cattle away. Either way, they're moving cattle. I just used an association, uh, you know, regular old quarter horse bar side on. Yeah, it'll roll around. Their skin's kind of loose, but. Yeah, no, it fit him just fine. There we go. Well, for folks who are curious about what Jerry Jones does and what the Jerry Jones family does, where can they appropriately stalk you online? Um, you know, we pretty much primarily stick to the Facebook. Uh, my wife does. I have one, but I don't really do much on it. But our, our Facebook page, our business Facebook page is Diamond 3 Performance Horses and Cow Dogs. Um, you can find us there on Facebook. You can also search Jerry Jones. Unfortunately, you'll probably get a, da- a lot of Dallas Cowboy stuff. Um, you can find us on my wife's is Jessica Jones. Um, you can find us on YouTube uh, videos under J Jones Performance Horses, also under Jerry Jones Cow Dogs. Um, emails are the same as that. Uh, J Jones um jay jones performance horses at yahoo and jerry jones cow dogs at yahoo but primarily the facebook page i think would be the best place to kind of watch we try to do most of it on that diamond three performance horses there we go Um, well thank you very much jerry for coming on the show this has been fascinating and we all are all looking forward to the adventures of your next saddle broken bovine which maybe you can teach your saddle broken bovine to cut cattle well, that's the idea. We're, we've got some pretty fun stuff in mind, and uh, it's just finding the right one for the job, you know, just like anything else. There we go. Bye-bye, Jerry. Bye-bye. Nice chatting with you. Oh, my gosh. That's just too funny, Mary. Too funny. I know. I was at an engraving class in Houston while the auction was going on, and, uh, you know, this cow was nothing super fancy. It wasn't like a big old spotted. No, it's a boring old white-faced Hereford. Yeah, really dull. Yeah, it's just a little brown cow. And uh, I kept showing my instructor. I was like, look at what this cow's up to now on the auction. And he goes, you're really obsessed with that cow, aren't you? And uh, yeah, it's it's really funny. So we may be seeing a lot more uh, performance cows cropping up online. I Um, I just need to get mine trained to stay in fences first and then maybe we'll see about writing <laughs> one them. step at a time <laughs> oh they're turds <laughs> all right well why don't we uh have a listen to one of our sponsors total saddle fit shoulder relief cinch and then we'll have time for one more quick reader's digest q a <laughs> The Total Saddle Fit Shoulder Relief Cinch, made expressly for Western saddles, is not just a cinch. It actually improves saddle fit and horse comfort. The way it does that is the center of the cinch sits in your horse's natural girth groove, while the sides are cut back to attach to your saddle's billets a little further back and prevents the saddle being pulled forward over your horse's shoulder. On top of that, the front of the cinch has cutbacks, which give the horse's elbows more space to move. In addition to these fitting features, these cinches also are available in a variety of washable and interchangeable liners, wool, fleece, or neoprene. You can find shoulder relief cinches at your local tax store, or you can go online to totalsaddlefit.com to learn more. All right, so we're going to do another listener question. Uh, This one is from Rachel Rosenthal. Tips to get a horse to stop nicely on their hindquarters. Um, Well, this is one of my specialties because I have... Yeah, and it's one of my favorite things to teach. It's so much fun. Uh, I have a background in reining, as some of you may know. I've worked for four years in reining barns. And, of course, we taught the the sliding stop, which is what most people think of when you think reining horse. So, you know, you see the horse run into the arena at top speed. And as soon as that owner, the trainer pulls the trigger and says, whoa, the horse buries his butt in the ground and slides for 20 feet. It's a, it's a thrilling, uh, thrilling maneuver. And even though uh, um, the vast majority of horses I train are not going to go be reiners at the maturity. I may only have them for, for a few months or like I have a couple of curly mustangs in for training that are super fun but they're just gonna they're gonna be family horses and trail horses they don't need to learn how to do a 20-foot sliding stop 
but I use many of the exact same methods that I use to teach a sliding stop to teach all my horses to stop. And the reason for that being is in order for the horse to do that brilliant sliding stop, they have to engage their hindquarters and stay incredibly light in the front end. When you watch a horse do a sliding stop, they do what I call pedaling. Their front feet look like they're riding a bicycle, um, and that helps guide the horse along the ground uh, rather than jamming into the ground and pogo sticking you out of the saddle. So the horse needs that collection, not lightness in the front end, engagement in the hind end to stop. Um, so uh, I start pretty simply in that when I am training my colts uh, and I start asking them to stop, I don't do it from a gallop, obviously. I do it from a walk. And actually, before I even do that, I make sure I can get softness in the horse's jaw and pole. Uh, at a standstill. So a little bit of vertical flexion really helps. Um, And then anytime I stop my horse, uh, I will ask for one backup step, at least one backup step. And what that's going to get the horse thinking is every time I stop, we back up. And in order to back correctly, they need that lightness in the front end, engagement in the hind end. uh, I know uh, if you ride dressage, you're thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, my horse can't back up in the stop. That's, the, you know, I, I believe it's a pretty strong deduction if they do that. I could be mistaken. But regardless, you don't want your horse to back up. Um, that's okay. You can absolutely teach this by, you know, teach them to, to stop by backing them up at the end of every stop and, and still prevent them from backing up uh, when you're in the show pen. Um, but so I get softness in, the, in their jaw, softness in their pole, and then I start uh, working from a walk. And any time I bring my horse to a stop, I ask him to back up. And another thing that I do uh, when I'm working on the stop, I actually have four cues total to get a horse to stop. And I teach them all separately, practice them all separately, and then the final product is I put them all together. So for me, my cues are I use my voice, so I say the word whoa. Um, I I relax my seat so when I sit down deep in the saddle and stop actively riding my horse, they should listen to my seat. Uh, I use my reins, so I lightly draw on the horse, ask him to soften in the bridle to stop, Um, and then I take my legs off of their sides. I don't throw them out and exaggerate. I just take my legs slightly off to let them know, hey, I'm inviting you to stop now. I'm no longer asking you to go. And the reason I have these cues is because if you rely on any method, if you rely too heavily on any one cue, um, your horse can become dull to it. So if you only stop your horse by pulling on the reins, it might work for a little bit. Pretty soon your horse is going to get uh, dull and heavy to the bridle, and they'll start coming forward onto their front end to stop instead of, sitting back on their hind end. Um, You know, same thing with uh, your voice, same thing with your seat, same thing with your legs. So I do all those things separately, and then I put them together. But um, the simple way to get one to start stopping on their hind end, like I said, is to get them to back up after every stop. I do this a lot at the walk, and then I'll work at the higher gates. The other thing you can do, maybe you don't want to back up, Um, or you want to change things up a bit, is I like to stop and then ask my horse to do a shoulder maneuver. So if it's a Western horse, you can do a little spin. If it's an English horse, turn on the haunches. So you could do a shoulder maneuver or a lateral maneuver. You can stop your horse and ask for a couple steps side pass. You can stop your horse and then ask for a leg yield. And the reason why I do this is my horse is going to start getting used to stopping and then they have to stay engaged and soft immediately after because I'm going to ask them to do a maneuver that requires engagement and softness. And if you get into the habit of we're going to stop, then we're going to do this. We're going to stop, and then we're going to do that. Your horse is going to remain light, prepared, and collected in the stop. Um, I do it gently at the lower gates, and then I, I'll move up to the trot and even the canter. And that's as brief as I can get on that one. I have a lot more to say, but I do realize we're running out of time. Yeah, well, that's, 
you can you can just you can go so deep into that one because there's so much involved. And the last one that you talked about is something I've actually used recently with Nigel because before he came to me, he had the um, halt and back a couple of steps. Well, what he has learned to do, and he came with this habit, is he halts and he backs a few steps and he ducks his head between his knees when he does it. And he just completely lands on his forehand once he's done it. He takes three steps back and he's still on his forehand. It didn't do any good. So I've actually started to take that method in that when we come to a halt, I will move off into a shoulder in or I will halt and ask him for a few steps of a turn on the haunches, which is a forward movement. If we were using dressage terms, those are both forward movements, encouraging the horse to push forward from his hindquarters. So regardless of what discipline you have, English, Western, or recreational riding, all really good skills. And I want to say a big thank you to Mary Kitzmiller for coming on again. The second Thursday of every month, she comes by and geeks out on training with us. And a big thank you to Horseware, who sponsors this episode each month. And we will be back again tomorrow with more Horses in the Morning.